American Enterprise Institute presents the Distinguished Lecture Series on the Bicentennial of the United States. Our host for this thought-provoking series is Vermont Royster, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with the Wall Street Journal and Professor of Journalism and Public Affairs at the University of North Carolina. I'm Vermont Royster with another in the Distinguished Lecture Series on the American Bicentennial sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit organization in Washington dedicated to the proposition that a competition in ideas is essential to the health of a free society. In honor of America's 200th anniversary in 1976, AEI has gathered some of the country's leading scholars to discuss several phases of our nation's history and development and their significance for the future. This lecture will be delivered by Dr. Martin Diamond, professor of political science at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb. Dr. Diamond will speak from Independence Hall in Philadelphia, a fitting location for his lecture, which deals with America's two founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Independence Hall was originally built as a meeting place for members of the province of Pennsylvania. Construction was begun in 1729 on what was then called the State House, but it wasn't completed until 1748. The bell tower was finished in 1753, and what was then called the State House bell was installed. The workman completed the job, gave the bell a test ringing, and it cracked on the first stroke. The bell weighed 2,000 pounds and had been cast in England. The job of repairing it went to local craftsmen named Pass and Stowe. Their work was successful, and what is now known as the Liberty Bell was hoisted back into place. The bell was sounded on July 8, 1776. And the adoption of the Declaration of Independence was officially proclaimed four days after the actual signing. The Liberty Bell was also rung on other historic occasions. It rang in triumph for George Washington's victory over Cornwallis at Yorktown in 1781, for victory in the War of 1812. It sadly told for the death of men who signed the Declaration of Independence. And on July 8, 1835, the Liberty Bell cracked once more while tolling a funeral dirge for Supreme Court Justice John Marshall. In 1777, a little more than a year after the signing of the Declaration, the British Army occupied Philadelphia, and Independence Hall became a barracks for English soldiers. The occupation lasted just nine months. Reports at the time said the building was in filthy and sordid condition, with the inside torn much to pieces. Ten years later, however, the building looked much the same as it does today. And delegates began arriving to draft the Constitution that would inspire the world. Four months later, when the Constitution was finally signed, Benjamin Franklin pointed to a chair with a half-sun painted on its back. I have often looked at that sun, said Franklin, without being able to tell whether it was rising or setting. But now at length I have the happiness to know it is a rising and not a setting sun. The Founding Fathers had many doubts about our new nation. And some of them will be examined in this lecture. Project director for the AEI Distinguished Lecture Series is Dr. Stephen J. Tonsa, professor of history at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Dr. Tonsa is here at Independence Hall, where he is introducing our speaker, Dr. Martin Diamond. It may seem, I suppose, inappropriate to those who know Martin Diamond well that uh, in this Quaker city, which uh, once was characterized by uh, simplicity of speech and directness and economy, uh, Martin Diamond, who is characterized by an elegant sufficiency of style, should be the lecturer. Uh, but this uh, contradiction is uh, only superficial. 
for Martin Diamond is one of the greatest uh, teachers, lecturers, and most powerful analysts in political thought in America today. He has published a number of distinguished and penetrating essays on the Federalist. He is a man who was schooled in the tradition of the late Leo, Leo Strauss at the University of Chicago, where he took his degrees. And he has served as a distinguished professor at Claremont Men's College in California, and is presently a professor at uh, Northern Illinois State University. Uh, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Professor Martin Diamond. Since I intend since I intend to uh, stick to my planned topic, I might as well begin by announcing it. Uh, I wish to uh, title my remarks this evening, The Revolution of Sober Expectations. And I'd like to begin with a statement of my pleasure at having the opportunity to speak on that subject in this hall. I am filled with uh, deep emotion at finding myself here in the place where were collected together the wisdom, the patriotism, the devotion to principle from which sprang the institutions under which we live. These lovely words, unfortunately, are not my own. They were preempted by Abraham Lincoln in February 1861, only weeks before he assumed the terrible burdens of his presidency. But I cannot possibly find words better to express my own deep emotion at having the opportunity to share with you in this hallowed place my reflections as these are occasioned by the impending bicentennial of our national birth. Because of the struggle then tormenting and dividing the Union, Lincoln was obliged to look back upon the origins of the Republic to find the wisdom, patriotism, and principle that might save the Union and sustain and inspirit its Republican institutions. We are under no such compelling necessity tonight. Our occasion is only inspired by the happy imminence of our bicentennial. And yet and yet, for us to a backward glance remains a necessity. Lincoln was obliged to look back to the men who met here in Independence Hall in 1776 because it was their thoughts and words expressed immortally in the Declaration of Independence from which sprang our institutions, the institutions under which we live. We live still, to an amazing extent, under those very same institutions. And like Lincoln, if we wish to understand those institutions, if we wish to grasp their wisdom and apply their principles to our own problems, then we too must return to the thoughts of the Founding Fathers. We too must look to its architects for the plan of the house in which we still reside. No task could be more agreeable to me here, the child of immigrant grandparents whose grateful patriotism instructed my youth and whose teachings I remember with great joy. Now, there is a fascinating ambiguity, and since I make my living in the realm of political philosophy, I delight at the discovery of possible ambiguities, and when they are not there, we even go so far as to invent them. But I do believe in this case, there is a fascinating ambiguity in the words of Lincoln, which I have quoted. We must remember that there were two great happenings here at Independence Hall. The first in 1776, when independence was proclaimed in the Declaration, the second, 11 years later, when the Federal Convention met here 
for four long months and drafted the Constitution. When we look back to our origins, we look to the same place here in Philadelphia, but to two different times and events. 1776 and 1787, the Declaration and the Constitution. They are the two springs of our national existence. To understand them and their relationship is to understand the political core of our being, to understand what it is we are soon to celebrate the bicentennial of. It is to the relationship of the Declaration and the Constitution, then, that I address my remarks. Let me repeat Lincoln's words. I am filled with deep emotion at finding myself here in the place where were collected together the wisdom, the patriotism, the devotion to principle, from which sprang the institutions under which we live. Now, what we want to understand is precisely how our institutions of government sprang from the Declaration. How and to what extent were those institutions generated by the Declaration of Independence? And what more had to be added actually to generate and frame those institutions? We find a clue, I believe, in Lincoln's further remarks in the speech I'm quoting from. His quote, wholly unprepared speech, close quote, he said, and that is humbling and yet inspiring to note the eloquence and thought which he was able to do in a wholly unprepared manner. He goes on to say, all the political sentiments I entertain have been drawn, so far as I am able to draw them, from the sentiments which originated and were given to the world from this hall in which we stand. I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Notice the emphasis on feeling and sentiment. Lincoln carefully limits his indebtedness to the Declaration to sentiments and feelings, that is, to the spirit within which he conceives government and its institutions. Indeed, he could not have done otherwise, for there is nothing whatsoever in the Declaration of Independence that supplies guidance as to what the character of those governmental institutions should be. As we shall see, noble document that the Declaration is, indispensable source of the feelings and sentiments of Americans and of the spirit of their institutions, the Declaration of Independence is utterly bereft of guidance as to the framing of the institutions of American government. Now, I've inferred that from Lincoln's words, his emphasis on thoughts and uh, sentiments and feelings. But in addition to what we can infer from Lincoln's speech, we have also the highest possible authority for the conclusion I've just stated. Namely, the testimony of the father of the Constitution, James Madison, and the acceptance of that testimony by the author of the Declaration, Thomas Jefferson. In 1825, the two patriarchs of the American founding engaged in a charming correspondence regarding a possible required reading list for students at the law school of the University of Virginia. Interesting thought. The two great patriarchs of freedom who knew that you had to require the proper readings to inculcate at the outset the true spirit of liberty. Uh, but it is not easy, Madison wrote, shrewdly, to find books that will be both guides and guards for the purpose. The work of John Locke, for example, Madison wrote, was, quote, admirably calculated to impress on young minds the right of nations to establish their own governments and to inspire a love of free ones. But Locke, he went on to say, could not teach these future young lawyers how to protect, quote, our Republican charters, that is, the American federal and state constitutions, and protect them from being corrupted by false constructions and interpretations. Locke, he said, great though his treatise on government is, offers no guidance to the meaning of our American institutions. Now, this would seem to have been cutting pretty close to the bone in writing to Thomas Jefferson, 
who was the author of the Declaration, had clearly drawn inspiration from John Locke. But Madison had no reason to hesitate in thus writing to his old friend because he could count on Jefferson's calmly agreeing with his view. Indeed, he proceeded to make his point even more explicitly. The Declaration of Independence, Madison continued, though rich in fundamental principles and saying everything that could be said in the same number of words, it never hurts to be gentle with an author's pride no matter how close a friend he is. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, though rich in fundamental principles, falls nearly under a like observation. That is to say, what was true of Locke is true also of the Declaration. Locke and the Declaration, Madison says, have the same limitations. What this careful 18th century language is saying is plainly this. The principles of Locke and of Jefferson's declaration are infinitely valuable for inspiring in young minds a proper love of free government. But that is all those principles reach to. The declaration Madison is saying, and Jefferson cheerfully agreed, offers no guidance for the construction of free government and hence offers no aid in protecting the American form of free government under the Constitution. For that purpose, Madison does not scruple to add, one must turn, quote, to the Federalist as the most authentic exposition of the text of the Federal Constitution. In short, the patriarchs Jefferson and Madison agree with Lincoln, as I have interpreted him, in their understanding of the noble but limited work of the Declaration of Independence. We're listening to Dr. Martin Diamond discussing the sober expectations of the American Revolution. In the first part of his speech, Dr. Diamond examined some of the thoughts of the men who framed the Declaration of Independence. In just one moment, he continues. From 1790 to 1800, Philadelphia was the nation's capital. Both House and Senate met here in Congress Hall. Here, George Washington's second inauguration was held. He made his famous farewell to Congress. He also turned over peacefully and without bloodshed the leadership of this nation, which for its time was the most unmarked and remarkable event of the entire American experiment. In our address, Dr. Diamond is about to point out that the founding of America was only half completed with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The American founding, as we shall see, is only begun by the Declaration. It reaches its completion only with the Constitution. But civilly pious as we ought to be tonight, we need not let the argument I am making rest only with the splendid authority of Lincoln, Madison, and Jefferson, but may sustain their judgment by our independent reading of the text of the Declaration. The relevant passage is the one usually printed as the second paragraph, the passage dealing with the four truths the Declaration holds to be self-evident. Now, this business about self-evident, by the way, doesn't mean evident to everyone, as it has come to be thought in these disbelieving relativistic days. Have you not heard this sort of mocking comment on those self-evident truths? The mockers say, those truths aren't evident to me, I'm in a different bag, and since they aren't evident to me, they cannot truly be truths. The author of the Declaration of Independence knew that those truths would not be self-evident to kings and nobles, not to predetermined adversaries of freedom, nor to anyone of insufficient or defective vision. Indeed, Jefferson knew that the truths he held to be self-evident had not hitherto been evident to the vast majority of mankind. By self-evidence, the Declaration meant something quite different. The self to which the evidence refers is not the selves to whom the truths are evident, but rather what the Declaration means is that the evidentness of the truths is contained within the truths themselves. That is, these peculiar kinds of truths 
are not to be reached at the end of a chain of reasoning. They are not the fruit of supporting data, evidence, inference, and argument, but rather to repeat, these truths carry the evidence of their truthfulness within themselves. Their truth is to be grasped by a kind of direct seeing or perception, and their truthfulness is to be vindicated for those who hold them by the truth and excellence of their consequences. It would be by means of these consequences that others would be led in time also to see and subsequently hold these truths to be self-evident. So it was up to the American Revolution and the future regime for the first time to universalize the holding self-evident of those truths. Now, the Declaration, to repeat, holds four truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that governments whose proper end is to secure those rights may only be instituted by the consent of the governed, and that when government becomes destructive of those ends or rights, the people have the further right to alter or abolish it, <coughs> excuse me, and reinstitute another in its place. Now, these truths do not rise by inference, one from the other, but are each independently, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but are each independently self-evident and together form the foundation for political society. <coughs> Yet for our purpose tonight, and perhaps even intrinsically, the most important truths are the two central ones, namely that the end of government is the securing of certain unalienable rights and that government must be instituted by consent. We have transformed the declaration in our minds by reading the phrase consent of the governed as meaning rule by majorities, that is to say democratic government. Indeed, we think of the Declaration of Independence as our great democratic document, as the clarion call to and the guide to our democratic nature. But the Declaration does not say that consent is the means by which government is to be operated. Rather, consent, it says, is necessary only to institute the government, that is, to establish the government. The people need not, however, establish a government which operates thereafter by means of their consent. The Declaration says that they may organize government on, quote, such principles as they choose, and they may choose, quote, any form of government they deem appropriate to secure their rights. That is, the Declaration of Independence was not prescribing any particular form of government at all, but rather was following John Locke's social contract theory, which taught the right of the people to establish the form of government calculated in their minds to secure their liberties. Although the Declaration is rich in fundamental principles, which nurture in humanity a love of free government, and thus supplied Lincoln with all his political sentiments and feelings, there is and can be no guidance, as Madison said, in the Declaration itself for the institutions of government which sprang from that love of freedom which the Declaration inculcated. That guidance is to be found in the thought which shaped the Constitution and is to be found in the Constitution itself which framed the institutions under which we live and it is to the Constitution that we must ultimately turn as the, to as the completion of the American Revolution. It was, so to speak, only half a revolution. It did, the American Revolution, it did overthrow a government, albeit a distant one. It did, in a revolutionary way, abolish an existing government, and that is at least half a revolution. But it did not, in the same breath, commit itself to the shape of the new government to be instituted. The American Revolution and its makers, the makers of the American Revolution, did not think themselves in possession of the single and complete political truth or of a simple panacea for government. They claimed possession of only half the truth, namely that equal freedom must be the foundation of all political society. And in the name of that equal freedom, they made half a revolution. But soberly and moderately, they left open the question of institutions of government. These, they knew, 
would have to be forged from old materials, worked and reworked, and with a cool awareness that the new American institutions would be subject still to perennial human frailty and folly. The Declaration of Independence thereby limited the dangerous passions of revolution only to the unmaking of tyrannical government. It gave no license to new rulers to carry those revolutionary passions into the making of new government. That new making of government would have to find its way through still uncharted paths to be trod soberly and prudently. But what have I left, <coughs> it may be asked, echoing words of Lincoln, what have I left of our once glorious declaration? I have as emphatically as I can argued that the declaration soberly left open the question of forms of government and of its institutions. And in so doing, I have perhaps reduced its claims and reach as these are now understood. But after the French and Russian revolutions, we have a different and utopianly grandiloquent idea of revolution. But I do not believe that Jefferson and his colleagues, or Madison or Lincoln, would have understood the Declaration otherwise than I have stated it, nor would they think me to have diminished it. From our perspective, it may look like only half a revolution, but they understood that that was nonetheless revolution indeed, and revolution enough. We are watching Dr. Martin Diamond discussing the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution from the site of those documents, Conception, Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Dr. Diamond has been discussing the meaning behind the truths that the Declaration of Independence says are self-evident. In a moment, he will continue. Today, Independence Hall is secure as a national shrine. Even before the bicentennial, two million visitors shared its memories each year. But in the early 1800s, Congress had moved to Washington, and the Philadelphia building was just the old state house. In 1816, the building was about to be torn down when the city of Philadelphia decided to buy it for $70,000. Inside, Dr. Martin Diamond is about to discuss why the American Revolution differed from other revolutions of its time. What was truly revolutionary in the American Revolution and in its Declaration of Independence? It was that that revolution and that declaration made liberty, civil liberty, the doctrine of certain unalienable rights, the end of government. Not as the end of government had been for millennia, whatever end power haphazardly imposed upon government, not virtue as the end, not piety, not privilege or wealth, not merely protection and law and order, not empire and dominion as the ends of government, but now the principle of liberty as the end of government. While modern followers, say, of Edmund Burke may warn against the dangers of devotion to abstract principles, they cannot blink aside the simple fact that of revolutionary American devotion to precisely such an abstract principle. And yet, there is indeed something moderate and non-utopian in the American devotion to liberty. But that American truth of liberty was as abstract as, say, Robespierre's tyrannizing abstraction or Lenin's tyrannizing truth. Whence then the difference? Wherein was the American Revolution one of sober expectations and the Jacobin and Leninists revolutions of unbridled expectations. It lies not in degrees of devotion to abstractness, but in the substantive nature of the principle they were abstractly devoted to. It is one thing to be abstractly devoted to the reign of virtue, or to unlimited equality, or to mass fraternity, whatever that would be, or to classless society, or to the transformation of the human condition itself and quite another to be devoted to the abstract principle of civil liberty. Civil liberty as a principle constrains its followers to moderation, legality, and rootedness in regular institutions. Moreover, moderate civil liberty does not require terror and tyranny for its fulfillment. 
Liberty is an abstract principle capable of achievement. Jacobin or Leninist equality or mass fraternity are not. Moderate civil liberty then, so to speak, is a possible dream. Utopian equality and fraternity are impossible dreams, and the recent popular song to the contrary notwithstanding, the political pursuit of impossible dreams leads to terror and tyranny in the vain pursuit of what cannot be. But what of democracy, we must now ask? Perhaps, as I have claimed, the Declaration of Independence is indeed neutral regarding democracy, but does not the American Revolution somehow have something to do with the establishment of democracy in this country? I acknowledge the force of the question. It does indeed, and the revolutionary establishment of democratic government in America is at once perhaps the most revolutionary element in the American Revolution, and at the same time the most sobering aspect of that revolution. Americans, as Tocqueville observed, were born equal. Born equal. This was so for many historical reasons, too familiar and complicated to dwell upon here. The Englishmen who came to this country were from the middling walks of life, and the institutions they developed here were far more democratic than those of their contemporaries and kinsmen in England. America, as Karl Marx was uh, uh, has observed in the same spirit as Tocqueville, America did not have a feudal alp pressing down upon the brow of the living. The stuff of American life was thus quietly being prepared during 170 years of colonial life in the direction of democracy. But democratizing as American experience was in that 170 years, colonial thought was still decisively pre-democratic. Colonial thought was in unanimous accord with the dominant English and continental belief in the doctrine of mixed government, or the mixed regime, or as Englishmen called it, the balanced constitution. This idea of the mixture of kinds of regimes more powerful than ever in the 18th century of England, derived from a 2,000-year tradition stemming from Aristotle. The idea of the mixed regime rested upon the premise that the pure forms of government, like monarchy, aristocracy, democracy, all tended to their own corruption. Any unbridled ruler, be he the one, the few, or the many, would become tyrannic. Hence the idea of the mixed or balanced regime, that is a combination of the three kinds into one to uh, prevent what would otherwise be the inevitable degeneration or corruption of any pure form. For example, in England this meant the balance of crown, lords, and commons. There was nearly universal agreement on this political prescription, especially on the part of the teaching which emphasized that pure democracy was especially untenable. But the American Revolution changed all this, and therein lay its profoundly revolutionary character. As Tocqueville again said, when the American Revolution broke out, quote, the dogma of the sovereignty of the people came out from the township and took possession of the government. The essentially popular character of American life was quickened by all the forces of the revolution. The logic of the struggle against royal and aristocratic England tilted Americans more wholly toward democracy. The flight of propertied Tories had the same effect. The old colonial institutions of government, always predominantly popular, became still more so with the removal of royal governors and councils. Democracy became the dominant fact of the new American Confederation of States. The Americans found themselves becoming democratic without having quite intended to become so, an apparently healthy way to ease gently into democracy. Once independence was declared, each of the colonies was obliged to flesh out its existing institutions and assume fully the responsibility for its own governance. And each of the new state constitutions, each of the new state governments, was a more fully democratic than had been its colonial predecessor. But in almost all of the new states, 
there were also significant vestiges, and perhaps more than vestiges, of the powerful old mixed regime idea. Some of you will recognize I am taking on Charles Beard at this point with the portrait of the states as the happy hotbeds of democracy and the Constitution as its Thermidorian retrogression. I mean literally to reverse that idea, but I will not take the time to elaborate further my intention. Uh, more than vestiges were to be found of the powerful old mixed regime idea. For example, wealth especially was given a privileged standing in almost all the state governments. Uh, the suffrage qualifications differed for the different levels of state office, popular house, upper house, and governor. Uh, suffrage qualifications differed for each. More property was required for the right of voting for the higher officer, and even more dramatically, there were steep property qualifications for office holding. The higher the office, the steeper the qualification. These vestiges powerfully testified to the force of the old idea of England's balanced constitution. Thus, democratic as had been the pace of events during the revolution, there still was the possibility that in time, the democratic tide would recede and that property and privilege, as they had had throughout all mankind, would reassert their perennial claims, especially perhaps in the South, where the slave development would have made that particularly likely, or perhaps, say, in Massachusetts, in the aftermath of such a struggle as that over the Shays Rebellion. But whatever might have been the possible course of events, whatever might have developed in each state or region, the massive demonstrable fact is that the fate and shape of democracy was settled on this continent by the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. For example, with one single little remarked clause of the Constitution, those vestiges of oligarchic privilege and of the mixed regime in the states, those live remnants of the mixed regime idea were forever barred and the idea of democracy was rendered complete in the American system. I refer to Article I, Section 2, which establishes the then broadest possible democratic franchise as the basis for federal election. There was no practical possibility thereafter under the Constitution for the gradual, insensible reintroduction of aristocracy, wealth, and privilege into the federal government. To this may be added the total absence of any property qualifications, contrary to existing state practices, for any federal office, and also the clause barring the introduction of titles of nobility, and finally the provision for the payment of salaries to federal office holders, thereby ensuring that men of any walk in life might in fact be able to serve the government. These quiet and usually unremarked clauses of the Constitution are part of the means by which the Constitution completed the most dramatic aspect of the American Revolution, namely the firm establishment of the democratic form of government. Dr. Martin Diamond has been discussing the unique qualities of the American Revolution and of the United States Constitution. In just one moment, Dr. Diamond will continue his address from Independence Hall in Philadelphia. As a repository of American history, there's probably no equal to Independence Hall. These are the books in which are recorded the votes of the men who guided this nation through its first hours. They were first kept in this original site of the Library of Congress. The voice in Congress Hall today belongs to Martin Diamond, who is concluding his lecture on a revolution of sober expectations. The Americans, with the Constitution, completed the half revolution begun in 1776 and became the first major modern people fully to confront the issue of democracy, a dramatically revolutionary event. But again, the American Revolution, precisely in its most revolutionary thrust, was simultaneously, distinctively sober. The way the Constitution confronted democracy 
is the third and perhaps the most important revel uh, element in the revolution of sober expectations, the sketch of which I have been developing. The sobriety lies in the founding fathers' cool-headed and cautious acceptance of democracy. Not one single American voice was raised in euphoric praise of democracy. There was universal recognition of the problematic character of democracy, a universal concern for its inherent weaknesses and the fear of the dangers natural to it. Among the Americans, there was universal recognition that democracy could be defended and established only under certain moderating and controlling conditions. The debate in American life during the founding decade gradually became a debate over how to create a decent democratic regime. Quite the contrary to our modern, much too complacent perspective regarding democracy, which assumes that a government cannot be decent unless it is democratic, our founding fathers universally were more skeptically, sensibly, and soberly concerned how to make their new government decent even though democratic. All the American revolutionaries, whether they were partisans of the theory that democratic republics had to be small or agrarian or only loosely confederated in order to remain stable and free, or whether they retained the traditional idea that democracy had to be counterbalanced by nobility or wealth, or whether they subscribed to the new theories implicit in the novel constitution. All the American revolutionaries knew that democracy was a problem to be solved, not a panacea to be swallowed, and that a democratic system of government would constantly need moderation and was by no means the universal political solve-all and be-all. Thus, the American Revolution soberly worked its way out of the 18th century into the era of modern democracy, soberly, prudently, seeking means to live with the emerging democracy. No debate is more instructive for modern Americans who wish to understand the genesis, and hence the genius, of the institutions under which they live, than the debates of the Federal Convention of 1787, that second event which hallowed this hall. And in contemplating that convention, we may now answer our earlier question. In what sense did our institutions spring from the Declaration, and what had to be added to bring those institutions into being? They sprang on the one hand from the love of free government inspired by the noble sentiments of Jefferson's Declaration, and on the other hand, from the theoretic genius of James Madison, whose sober clarity regarding democracy gave the shape and thrust to our unique democratic form of government. The way was opened for the quiet and mild genius of James Madison, who spent much time in this hall. The way was open for his quiet and mild genius to gain its ascendancy by a stroke of good fortune that could lead one almost to attribute the success of the Constitutional Convention to the direct intervention of divine providence. Namely, the fact that during the summer of the Convention, John Adams happened to be in London and Thomas Jefferson in Paris, happily carried away from these shores to do diplomatic duty for their country. Had these two formidable figures, <clears throat> the one a lingering partisan of the idea of the mixed regime, John Adams, and the other too easily given to a shallow and mere libertarianism that would have vitiated the effectiveness of government and the strength of the Union, Thomas Jefferson. Had these two formidable figures been in Philadelphia in 1787, I do not believe the single clear vision of Madison would have been able to prevail as much as it did. And in my judgment, that one half of a revolution, the revolution of sober expectations of 1776, would never have been so successfully completed as it was, in fact, 
by the framing and adoption of the Constitution. I think that de Tocqueville, whom I've quoted several times, understood that what distinguished the American Revolution was indeed, as I have been urging, its successful ascent to the Constitution. Indeed, he regarded our revolution with the scorn appropriate to a Frenchman who'd seen a really big one. Uh, he thought that our revolution was a two-bit revolution by comparison with the French, and he was, of course, quite right. And he thought, he said, indeed, explicitly, it was ridiculous to compare the American Revolutionary War to the French wars of the Revolution and of the Republic, in which a 20th part of the mankind of France was flung across the continent of Europe in successful warfare. But he goes on to say, <clears throat> if America ever approached, for however brief a time, that lofty pinnacle of glory to which, it's, to which the proud imagination of its inhabitants is wont to point, it was at this solemn moment when the national power abdicated, as it were, as it were its authority. He refers to 1786-87. And then he says, what is truly novel in human history, it is new in the history of society to see a great people turn a calm and scrutinizing eye upon itself when apprised by the legislature that the wheels of its government are stopped, to see it carefully examine the extent of the evil and patiently wait two whole years until a remedy is discovered, to which it voluntarily submitted without it costing a tear or a drop of blood from mankind. The reason for this incredible patience, which Tocqueville recognized to be the unique American historical phenomenon of the end of our revolution, <clears throat> the reason for this remarkable patience was the initial sobriety of the revolution, a sobriety based upon the mildness of its aim, namely free government, of its awareness of the permanent limits of human frailty, and of its sober recognition of the dangers and difficulties of democracy. On this approaching bicentennium of the revolution, I have tried to turn our attention to the two founding documents of our national being, the Declaration and the Constitution. And I've tried to make it impossible for us to think of the one without simultaneously thinking of the other. In this I have followed, but I have, I have also reversed the magisterial effort of Lincoln. Lincoln devoted himself to drawing the Americans of his generation back from the Constitution to the Declaration. He did so because in his generation, Americans were then emptying the Constitution of its inspiriting love of equal freedom for all. In the interests of slavery and of compromise with slavery, Americans then were reducing the Constitution to a mere legalistic compact, emptied of the abstract truth which had given it its sentiments and feelings and had made it a promise and a model to all mankind. He wished when men said Constitution, they would think simultaneously Declaration. That's the reason four score and seven years. 87 years, 1863 back to 1776, root the American national origin back in the moment of the sentiments and feelings of freedom which the Americans of his generation were lo losing. Today our needs are otherwise. Our two documents must, as always, be seen as indissoluble. But now we need train ourselves when hearing the Declaration's heady rhetoric of revolution and freedom, always soberly, simultaneously, to see the Constitution as the necessary forming, constraining, and sustaining system of government that made our revolution a blessing to mankind and not a curse. In an age of rising expectations, in an age of unbridled utopian expectations, it is useful to look back to the sources of our sobriety and to link always the sentiments and feelings of freedom and human emancipation 
with the constraining and channeling that our constitutional system of government properly represents. I hope you will permit me in closing to indulge myself in one more flight of rhetoric. I have made no effort tonight to speak to any of the grave contemporary issues that tear at us and surfeit us with apparently endless crisis. But whatever we each think must be done to solve this or that grave problem, I call upon you tonight to take your guidance and bearing from that double star of undiminished magnitude, which in two great exertions of political sentiment and intellect burst forth from this hall. Thank you. We just heard a lecture by Professor Martin Diamond on the revolution of sober expectation. Dr. Diamond discussed the role of the Constitution in the Declaration of Independence in making the American Revolution into what Dr. Diamond calls a blessing to mankind. Tonight's lecture is one in a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute dealing with the many aspects of the American Revolution and its meaning for modern America. If you would like a copy of Dr. Diamond's lecture or copies of the entire series, write the American Enterprise Institute. That's AEI Box 19191. Washington, D.C., 236. Until next time, this is Vermont Royster. Thank you for joining us.